The book we're talking about today is a book called Not a Fan. And before I get into the book, Not a Fan, and if you were here two weeks ago, I preached on Crazy Love by Francis Chan. This is kind of a sequel to what I preached about last time. And so uh, before I get into that, I wanna go back to when I was in school, when I was in high school. And I, I talk about when I was in high school a lot, and a lot of it has to do with atheism, but today has nothing to do with atheism when I was in high school. Today has to do with just who I was in high school. I was an awkward kid in high school. Um, I had a lot going for me, but then I had a lot not going for me. And specifically, there's one area in my life I was not good with that. And it was with girls, with women. I, I, was, I was terrible with them. I, I always struggled to have a girlfriend. And I always wondered, like, what is it that girls don't like about Roger? I, I couldn't understand this in middle school, in high school. And before I, before I get to that, um, you say, well, Roger, like, were you the same then that you were now? Yes, but not really. And so I want to share a quick story when my family and I went to Vegas, that I was uh, 18 years old, 17, 18 years old, and my family said, hey, we're gonna take a family vacation to Las Vegas. And so before we get to Las Vegas, oh, don't show the picture yet, it just ruined the punchline. <laughs> just ruined the punchline. So we get to Las Vegas, and my family tells me, we have to get one family picture together. We have to get everybody together for one picture. And my mom said, listen, you can't make a stupid face. You can't, you can't do anything like that. Because if, you, if you've ever been to one of these places, they take the picture, they don't share the picture, but they put it in like a little, a little thing and then they give you the picture. And so we get together, we take the picture and um, my mom's like, again, don't make a stupid face. The only picture, this is the only vacation we ever went on, by the way, as a family. And that was, that's not me, but going back to the main picture, this is my favorite picture of all time. Maybe the most awkward family photo of all time. And uh, when, my mom, when my mom received it, when she finally looked at it, and by the way, she paid like $50. You know, you don't, you don't get those pictures. Um, you don't get those pictures for free. They charge you an arm and a leg. And so that picture, I think my mom just handed it to me. She said, I don't want it. And then I, I brought it back to, to Missouri. I share that as well. Uh, since, but where's Barbara Goodwin at? Barbara, yeah, you're over here. So me and Barbara, speaking of pictures that you buy, I almost forgot to share the picture that Barbara and I, when we went to Sodar City a couple of weeks ago to just show you another picture. This one is 2024, Roger, but this is uh, Barbara and I, and you can see the tongue is out and that is fire in the hole. Barbara turns 80 years old in December and the entire time I'm like, Barbara, are you gonna live if we get on this roller coaster? And she just said, sit down and shut up. And so we rode, <laughs> we rode every single ride. So 31 years old versus 17, 18 years old. It's the same guy. I'm just got a beard and a lot less hair. So that goes back to though, when I was nice, I was kind of an awkward kid. And I, I, I would talk to girls and I would think that girls were into me. And I was thinking like, okay, I think I finally found one that, that I can date. And then it just wouldn't work out. She would go date somebody else. But there was one girl in particular when I was an underclassman. I think I was a freshman or a sophomore. And this particular girl, I really, really liked. And I assumed she really, really liked me. We were talking. We were texting. I mean, late at night, we would be texting. Early in the morning, I would text her good morning. To the point that I'm like, I think she's my girlfriend at this point. I didn't ask her that, but you just assume, right? Until somebody came up to me and said, hey, did you hear that particular girl has a boyfriend. I said, I know, I'm so excited. And they said, yeah, he seems like a really good guy. And I'm like, thank you. And they're like, no, it ain't you. And I said, who is it? And they said, it was some other guy. And I remember I, I found the girl in, in the hallway and I'm like, wait a second. If you're dating him, then what are we? And she said, well, Roger, you're one of my best friends. And I said, oh no, that's not what I wanted to hear. I thought we were more than friends, right? And, and, and that guys can relate to that maybe more than girls. But I, I found out that in most of my friendships that with girls that I wanted to be my girlfriend, they wanted all the benefit, but they didn't want any of the commitment, right? And I made an error called DTR. If you don't know what DTR is, it's an acronym that means define the relationship. I didn't define the relationship with these girls. I just assumed, hey, we're texting. Hey, she smiles at me. She's nice to me. Therefore, I think she likes me. That was never the case. It was never the case because I did not do an adequate job defining the relationship. And some of these girls that I thought, well, they just want all the benefit of me as a friend. 
as a pick-me-up, but they didn't want any commitment with me. If you don't know who I am, by the way, I got married last year, so it has to happen. Like, it's, it's good. I, I eventually got out of that phase, and I eventually did ask Caitlin, hey, do you like me more than a friend? She said yes, after like the fourth date. So uh, that's the good news. But I think we take our relationship in the world of, okay, we don't define the relationship. We know experiences where people want all of the benefit, but they don't want the commitment. And I say, okay, well, that's the same when it comes to our walk with Jesus. For so many of us, we want a no strings attached relationship with Jesus where, hey, I get the benefit of following Jesus, of saying that I'm following Jesus, right? I get the eternal life of following Jesus. I get the blessings that my, like all of these things, there's so much benefit in our world of calling yourself a Christian. But then when we look at the commitment, the question is, well, yeah, that, 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 that's not the no strings attached relationship that I want. I see it all the time. I see it um, in, in our community. I see it in our town. I see it in our world. And I see it in our church where so many people, they say, hey, there's a benefit of calling myself a Christ follower until I get on Facebook or until I start gossiping or until I just start sinning out loud and confessing where my heart is actually at. And I say, well, you, you need to define the relationship with Jesus because you're basking in the benefit, but there's no commitment in following Jesus for so many different people. And if you want evidence of that, people tell on themselves all the time, just get on Facebook and you'll see a lot of people that are fans of Jesus, but there's no evidence whatsoever in them following Jesus. Every single day we see it. So as we talk about this, as we talk about defining the relationship, Kyle Eidelman wrote this book called Not a Fan because he said, we live in a world where there's a bunch of fans of Jesus, but we see very little followers in 2024. He, he gives this example in chapter one. He says, when he was in high school, he was a new Christian. He was the head of the FCA. I mean, he was doing all these amazing things. And as a Christian, he had two posters on his wall. The first poster is the greatest basketball player of all time, not named LeBron James, Michael Jordan. He had that poster on his wall. Because Michael Jordan back then, you think Kyle Adam was growing up in the 90s. And Michael Jordan was big. And he loved Michael Jordan. But here's the irony. Here's, here's the beauty of, of the illustration. You know what poster Kyle Eidelman, as a high school Christian, had right next to Michael Jordan? He had this poster, a poster of Jesus. And amen is right. Like, that would be cool. I'd love, like, if, my, if I had some high schoolers, like, I got a Jesus poster in my, in my room. I don't think a lot of people have that. But he said it was, it was, it was beautiful because Kyle Eidelman says, I was a fan of Michael Jordan. I admired Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan inspired me. He says, but then I looked at Jesus and he said, I was a fan of Jesus. I admired Jesus. Jesus inspired me. He said, I was treating Michael Jordan the same way that I was treating Jesus Christ. I rooted for them. I was a fan of them. They inspired me, but he said there was no commitment in that relationship. Kyle Ottoman said, I came to the realization that I, like much of the world and much of the church, I wasn't a follower of Jesus. I was merely a fan. So what is a fan? Here's the definition of, of what a fan is. A fan is an enthusiastic admirer, okay? We admire and we have affection. And we think, you know, uh, when someone says, are you a Christian? You say, I have so much affection towards Jesus Christ. That, that's amazing, most of our world has affection towards celebrities and politicians and athletes. Affection is nice, but Jesus says, I want more than your affection. I want your devotion. Affection is nice, but devotion takes it a step further. It's taking the difference between affection and comparing it to devotion. In the gospel of John, as Jesus is walking, and, and I think we've got the verse, but John chapter six, Jesus says this. He says, a great crowd of people followed Jesus as he was going and he's performing these miracles. And some people in today's church, they say, well, I don't like churches with big crowds because I don't think Jesus would. And it's like, the whole New Testament is just Jesus and crowds, okay? Like, I understand, I don't like crowds sometimes either, but crowds can be a good thing because that's more people that are hearing the gospel. It's more people that are being equipped so Jesus attracted great crowds. He wasn't afraid of crowds. 
But you know what Jesus was able to distinguish in those crowds? Because there were thousands of people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people following Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm so glad that you're following me. He said, but I want to distinguish those that are following with your feet and those that are following with your heart. There were a lot of people that followed Jesus with their feet. They were fans of Jesus. They heard what he did. They heard about the miracles. They heard about these amazing things. And so with their feet, they walked with Jesus. They followed Jesus with their feet. But Jesus saw so many of them and said, you're following me with your legs. You're not following me with your heart. You have an affection for me because you've seen what I have done, but you do not have a devotion for me. Jesus attracted great crowds, but I can imagine in those great crowds, there was only a percentage of people that truly understood the concept of devotion over affection. And that's why I wanna ask the question today, very simple question. Does our church today, do we, do we resemble more so a stadium of affectionate admirers or do we resemble a church of devoted followers? Which one do we resemble? Are we a stadium of affectionate admirers? We admire Jesus or should we instead resemble a church of devoted followers? I know we all wanna say the second one. That's the easy answer, right? If, if we were taking a quiz, you, that would be the correct answer. But I'm not asking for the correct answer with your mouth. I'm asking for the correct answer in how we as a church and how we as individuals in the church, how we live out our faith. Are we doing it as admirers? Or are we doing it as devoted followers of Jesus Christ? So we're gonna get into Luke chapter nine. And we're gonna look at three people in Luke chapter nine. Very, very quick um, summary uh, uh, of what has been going on. Jesus has been healing people, which is a lot of the gospel, right? A lot of the people are seeing the amazing things that Jesus is doing. And now people are saying the words, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. And we see in just these few verses, we see three people who want to be followers, but in all actuality, they're just fans. So you're just like, am I a fan? Am I a follower? Well, let's look at some fans in Luke chapter nine. So beginning in verse 56, it says this, it says, then Jesus and his disciples, they go to another village. So what does that tell us? They just came from what? A village. That's deductive reasoning, right? So another village would imply that he came from another village. And before that, he probably went to another village and Jesus is going village to village to village. Why is Jesus doing that? Because he wants people to follow him. Now, I wanna say something that's very controversial and, and, and please don't take this the wrong way. But the church, what we do, and when I say we, I mean us too, right? And there's nothing inherently wrong with this. When we talk about salvation, we dim the lights, we play the piano, we talk about sin, and we talk about all these things, and we say, but right now, you can leave that life behind you, and you could run into a new life, and you're emotional, and you're crying, and you make a decision, and then you come up, and then we hug you, and that's 99% of when we talk about salvation, that's how the church today does it, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? You have to have emotion in order to make a decision. However, in the New Testament, Jesus never dims the lights. He never plays the piano. Instead, Jesus says, hey, I want you to make a long-term commitment, but before you make this long-term commitment, I really want you to think long and hard about what you are about to do. Jesus doesn't, he doesn't you know, say this, this emotion-inducing prayer, and then people started crying, and they say, guess what, I said the prayer, and they said, yay, and then they, like, no, that, that, that's not the New Testament model. In the New Testament model, it's Jesus saying, hey, if you do this, you will surely die a fleshly death. If you do this, your family may walk out on you. If you do this, you may lose your job. You may lose your livelihood, but guess what? In that, you will get eternal life. Do you want to follow me? And in some cases, people said yes, and Jesus said, no, you don't, because I can see your heart. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if I did the sinner's prayer? Someone comes up here and says, I said the prayer. I made the decision. I said, no, you didn't. You need to go back, and you really need to rethink what it means to follow Jesus, and don't come up to me again until you get it figured out. Man, we'd have four people. We'd have a Bible study and there'd be nobody left. So we see in Jesus, he's not just asking for a, boom, you made the decision. You get to go to heaven. Now go do whatever you want. Oh, you made the decision. Great. Here's your card to just sin and, and, and live life how you want to live life. No, he says, if you're going to follow me, here's what you are signing up for. Here is the commitment that I'm requiring of you. That's what we see in the New Testament. So Jesus is going to these villages. In the next verse, we meet fan number one. As they're walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. We think, okay, great. He said the words. 
But what you may not know is shortly before this passage, this fan, this man that tells Jesus, I will follow you, he just saw Jesus heal a paralyzed man. He saw a man that couldn't move, Jesus heals him, and then the, move, the guy gets up and he moves, he walks around. So Jesus knows that what this guy has experienced is incredible. What he has observed is incredible. And this man right here, he's saying, Jesus, I am affectionate towards you. I admire what you just did. Going back to Michael Jordan, it'd be like when Michael Jordan, the flu game, when he scored all those points and he won the game and he got off the court, it'd be like one of his biggest fans says, Michael, I, 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 I'm your biggest fan. I love you so much. And they're just crying. And it's like, yeah, in the moment, you just experienced something that was incredible. But that in itself may not dictate where your heart is at. And so this man on the surface, he says, Jesus, I'm gonna follow you. And Jesus responds to this. He says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. That's a weird thing to say to someone that just said, I'll follow you. And Jesus says, hey, you wanna follow me? Guess what? The animals have more benefits than than it does to follow me, worldly benefits. You know, birds have nests. They, they can go home, and, but you follow me, you're not gonna have a pillow, just so you know. That's Jesus's response. Because Jesus saw in this man that self-denial was very hard. Self-denial was, was hard because that's true for most of us. We do not want to deny ourselves because we love comfort. This man loved comfort. And so Jesus says, you love comfort, be ready to have back issues if you follow me because we don't sleep. We love comfort. We are people of comfort. I remember 10 years ago, I think, 10, 15 years ago, I was watching TV, and this is back when infomercials were still a big thing. You guys remember the Snuggie? Yeah. I remember the first time, this is a true story. I, I remember where I was at the first time I saw an infomercial for this, introducing the new Snuggie. And I remember, I'm sitting on the couch, and I look at my mom, and I say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I said, that's not gonna sell 10 things. That's a backwards robe. They took a robe and they reversed it. I said, no way do people buy that. It's like a month later, it's the, it's the, it, they've sold out of Snuggies. Like the whole world is buying Snuggies. And I said, okay, I guess America's dumber than I thought. Like, wow, we, we, we all bought the Snuggie. Like, and it, it wasn't like a $5, like you could just go get your dad's rope. It was like a $40 Snuggie and everyone's buying these Snuggies and they're just stupid. They look dumb too, right? Everyone's wearing a Snuggie. You go to Walmart, it's like, oh, of course you've got a Snuggie. Everyone's wearing Snuggies, why? Because we are people of comfort and we will, we will stretch our necks out to be able to receive that comfort, even if it means taking a robe and reversing it and selling it for $40 because it makes us comfortable. We love comfort, but we also love convenience. We love convenience and we hate being inconvenienced. In, in, in the book, Not a Fan, Kyle, Kyle Adelman writes about these people, I've never heard about them before, called flexitarians. Have you ever heard of flexitarians? I hadn't either. I had to do some research, they do exist. A flexitarian, you know what a vegetarian is, right? You don't eat meat. A flexitarian is a vegetarian that only occasionally eats meat. I'm like, what? what? If you eat meat, you're not a vegetarian. You can't do that. Like, that, that, that makes no sense. I mean, that's like, that's like asking me, like, let's say I was an alcoholic and you're like, I hear you're sober. I'm like, six days a week, buddy. It's amazing. It's like, no, you're, not. you're still... That's, that's, that's not good, man. You get, get to seven, you know, like, oh, you're almost there. But I think like he, he uses the analogy of flexitarians of like, it's vegetarians that are like, listen, we really love animals, but we really love bacon too, you know? Animals are cute, but bacon is tasty. You know, like that's the, that's the fight that, pe that people are having. And he says, Christians today are flexitarians. I really love Jesus but I really love this. And I will follow Jesus most of the time, but I'm gonna flex when it meets my convenience. We love comfort and we love convenience over commitment. This man lived in comfort. We can assume he lived in convenience. And Jesus said, you are not ready for that commitment with where your heart is at. So from here, that's fan number one. Let's get to fan number two. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first, let me go and bury my father. Okay, that's a reasonable request, Jesus. Goodness gracious, let the guy bury his father. Well, notice what he says, first. Yes, Jesus, I will follow you, but first, right? I mean, and that's so many of us. Like, 
we, we, we faith how we diet, okay? And, and I'm, goodness gracious, like poster child here. Like, hey, I heard you're starting your diet. Yes, but first, let me finish this chimichanga because it's so good, right? I mean, I, I'm not gonna throw this away. Like, I, 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 I'm gonna start my diet, but first, I've got, I've got a, 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 a celebration on Saturday and there's gonna be ice cream cake, but I'm gonna start Monday. And then Monday, what happens? Oh no, somebody brought in cookies. Jeanette brought in kettle corn. Like, oh no, now I gotta start my diet tomorrow. But then Tuesday comes, Taco Tuesday, hello. I'm not starting my diet on a, on a Tuesday, are you kidding me? And then we get to Wednesday, well, Rob's making corn dogs. I'm not passing out on corn dogs. Thursday, so, but that's the point. Like, okay, well now I gotta do it, but first, but first, but first, but first. Right, I diet like how cicadas come out. It's like, okay, at some point, I'm gonna start but it's not right now. It may be 15 years. <laughs> but that's how we died in our, and that's, I mean, goodness gracious, that's, that's just how we live our lives. But first, let me do this. And that's the same for us. I'm gonna follow Jesus someday, but first, I, I, I gotta do this. But first, you know, that Netflix special that I've been watching that has an F word every other second, and there's no, I, I, gotta, I got four more episodes left, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my heart where I need to be. Or I've got this relationship that I know I need to get rid of and, and, and it's just poisoning me, but no, I'll follow Jesus after I take care of that. And that's what this man is. He say, first, let me take care of this. And so this is how Jesus responds to him. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Again, you're like, Jesus, you're so inconsiderate. This guy just said he's gotta go bury his dad. And you say, let the dead bury their own dead. But you have to understand something. How do we know his dad's dead? Most scholars that read this say his dad's probably not dead, right? His dad is probably alive and well. And he's saying, Jesus, I will follow you once my dad dies and I can bury him. Why? Because I won't have to tell my dad that I'm leaving and following you, but also I can collect his inheritance, right? So I'm gonna wait till he does die. Then I don't have to answer him then I could come back with my worldly wealth, Jesus, and then I can follow you. And Jesus says, well, let him bury himself then if that's the way you look at it. I mean, it'd be like if you got arrested and you're in the, you're, let's say you're a teenager, you just got arrested for doing something stupid and the cop is like, hey, are you gonna tell your dad? And you're like, yeah, when I bury him. Does that mean you're gonna go home like, hey, I gotta go bury my dad? And no, it means like, I don't wanna tell him that because my dad will kill me. So I'm gonna wait as long as possible. It's the same concept. So on the surface, Jesus seems inconsiderate, but what he's saying is, hey, I see where your heart's at. I see, I see where your commitment is at. And so fan number two, again, we already have two, and then we get to number three. So this is our third fan. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first, there it is again. This one makes the most sense. But first, let me at least say bye to my family. Let me at least say goodbye to my family. Like, Jesus, I'll leave everything, but I at least need to go talk to them. I at least need to tell them. You're like, well, I don't see how that's a fan. He seems like a follower. But what does Jesus tell us a few chapters later in the book of Luke? It's one of the most controversial verses in the Old New Testament. It's very misunderstood. But Jesus says, hey, you want to be my disciple? You must first hate your mother and your father. You want to follow me? You must first hate your family. And some people read that and they think, it's Jesus. I thought Jesus said, don't hate. And here he's telling me to hate my family. Jesus is speaking in, in a hyperbolic way, hyperbole. He's saying, hey, if you want to follow me, your family must become second. Your spouse must be second. Your children must be second. Your job, your livelihood, all of that needs to be second. And so this man is revealing that Jesus is still second because his first thing that he says, after I'll follow you, he says, but first... I have to address my family. And Jesus says, no, I am first, they are second. You address me, and then from there your family will come. And we live in a society where we, we, we love our families, which is a good thing. Don't stop loving your family, but love, your fa believe, love Jesus more than your family. That's a crazy statement, right? I want you to love Jesus more than you love your wife and husband and children and, and the whole nine yards. I want you to love Jesus above all else. Right, and I've said this before when I do premarital counseling and someone says, I, I love this person more than anyone. I said, well, you're not gonna make it then. You're just not. I mean, if you put your spouse above Jesus, it's not gonna work. You have to put Jesus first and foremost. So Jesus sees that. He says, hey, Jesus, I'll follow you, but first I gotta go address the priority in my house. And Jesus says this. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit 
for service in the kingdom of God. Jesus knows if this man goes back to his family, one or two things are gonna happen. Either A, his family's gonna talk him out of it, which would make sense. It means he has a good family for what they know. They don't know Jesus the way this man has followed Jesus. I mean, imagine if your child came home and said, hey, I'm leaving forever because I'm following this person. Are you gonna pack their bags? Are you gonna fluff their pillow? No, you're gonna lock the doors and you're gonna sit them down and you're gonna say, you're not leaving this house because what about your future wife? What about your future children? What about your job? What about your college education? There's no way you can leave this house. So Jesus knows he goes back to his family. His family, there's a very good chance they're going to talk him out of it and he will then no longer follow Jesus. But number two, what can happen? He goes back to his house. He shuts the door. He lays in bed and he realizes, oh, this is better. This is nice. I love the comfort and the convenience of my house. Yeah, I'll follow Jesus from my bedroom. I can still follow him. I, I, I just won't do it all the time. I won't, I won't follow him 24 hours a day. I, I'm gonna live here in my comfort. And then when it's convenient, I'll go ahead and, and follow Jesus. But for now, I'm just gonna hit the snooze button. Hit the snooze button the second I get into my house. So Jesus knows. He goes back to his home. He addresses his parents. There's a very good chance his heart will change in doing that. Jesus says, you wanna follow me, drop your net. You wanna follow me, pick up your cross. You wanna follow me, drop what you're doing, follow me. Notice he always says that. You wanna follow me, drop what you're doing, follow me, right? And so we have the third person who prioritizes family over following Jesus. Three different fans. And on the surface, you read that and you're like, man, all three of those are way more committed than me. And, and I could relate to that. There's a lot of chapters that I wish I was at least fan number three or fan number two or even fan number one. But the fact is, is that they were all admirers of Jesus. They had affection, but their devotion was not where Jesus wanted it at that point. So let's ask the question. Let's DTR, let's, let's, let's define the relationship with Jesus. I wanna define your relationship. I wanna define my relationship. Is Jesus in your life, is he your one of many or is he your one and only? Because for most of us, if we were honest, we would say, I'm a fan of Jesus. He is one of many in my life. I want you to imagine, and I'm not gonna use me as an example because I don't want anybody to cut this sound bite and put it on Facebook. Um, but I want you to imagine that you see a church member at a restaurant. And let's say this is a male church member. He's married to a wife and he's at a restaurant. And you walk in and he's clearly on a date. There's flowers on the table. He's in a nice outfit. And across from him is a woman that is not his wife. And let's say he's a, he's a higher up member of the church and he's well-respected and you immediately get angry, right? And you should get angry. And so you storm up to his table and you say, hey, what in the world are you doing? Who is this woman? And he says, well, this is my date tonight. And you say, well, that makes me even angrier. And so you ask, well, how could you do this? What about your wife? Where's your wife at? And he says, my wife's at home. And you say, well, why is this okay? And he says, well, because I got a date night with my wife on Friday. Tonight's not my date night with my wife. Tonight's my date night with this woman. But I'm gonna get to her on Friday. Yeah, and some of you are like making an ugly face. You should. And now you also know why I didn't use me as an example. But like in that illustration, you pull a Jesus and start flipping some tables over, right? Because that's a despicable thing to say. But how is it any different in how we follow Jesus? How is it any different in how we follow Jesus? When we see a person of Christ do an utterly unchrist like action or live in an utterly unchrist like way and their response is, hey, I'm getting to Jesus on Friday. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of the Jesus side of things, but right now I'm focused on my way of life. I'm focused on my walk with myself and not Jesus. And for so many of us, we are on a date with the priorities that we have in life, the convenience that we have in life, the comfort that we have in life. And someone says, hey, but I thought you, 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 you're following Jesus. He said, yeah, I'm following Jesus on Friday. I'm following Jesus tomorrow, but right now I'm focused on this in my life. And I think that that illustration, as uncomfortable as it is, I think so well defines where so many of us are at. We're fans, 
Jesus is one of many things in our life that's important, but he in no way resembles the one and only. And honestly, you know the faith that I want? I want a faith where Jesus is first and foremost in everything that I do. I want a faith, and some of you, this may make you uncomfortable. I want a faith where if Jesus tells me, hey, leave your family and follow me, my response is, okay. Leave your spouse, leave your children, okay. Because I love them, but I love you more. And I know that sounds terrible. That sounds, that sounds heinous. The gospel's a radical thing, right? The gospel is a radical thing and it changes lives. It transforms lives, but in order for it to happen, you have to allow it to happen. We are arrogant in thinking giving Jesus a date night is following him. We think we honor Jesus with our scraps and all we do is insult him. So when we change affection to devotion, when we change affection to devotion, it gives us clarity in life, it gives us direction, right? I want you to admire Jesus. I want you to read the Bible and just be at awe of the things that Jesus did. I'm not saying stop doing that. Kyle Eidelman in this book, which I would encourage you again, very easy read. Many of you have already come up to me and said, oh, we did a Bible, we did a a book study on Not a Fan several years ago. Great, it's a great book. It's a book that I recommend to a lot of my students, but it's also a book that I recommend to a lot of people in the church that think what they are doing is adequate in the eyes of Jesus. That what they're doing is, hey, I'm giving Jesus this and and, and that's all that matters. They're, They're giving Jesus a date night on Friday and they're saying, okay, great but every other day of the week, every other moment of their life, it's focused on me, 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 and not him. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. The good news comes in Matthew chapter 16. And this is the English standard version. The the NIV says, whoever comes after me, but the ESV, and I think this is more relevant. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him come deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I've been sharing that verse a lot lately. I've been sharing that verse a lot in my sermons, but I feel like that's where God has me right now. And when I was picking books and and I picked this and I did not a fan or I did a crazy love by Francis Chan two weeks ago. And I'm thinking like, are these books kind of the same? Yeah, they kind of are. But yet I feel like that is what we need to hear right now. But the good news, Matthew chapter 16. What does Jesus say? If anyone, what does anyone mean? Anyone means anyone. Anyone and everyone. We all have the ability, we all have the opportunity to follow him. And I don't wanna resemble a church of fans enthusiastic admirers that don't want to inconvenience ourselves. We don't want to discomfort ourselves. But I want a church of people that will do anything and everything for the gospel. And the good news is you can do that, anyone. Doesn't matter what chapter of life you're in right now. Doesn't matter what keeps you up at night. Doesn't matter what guilt is hanging you down. It doesn't matter if, 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 if you feel like you're in the darkest moment of your entire life. Doesn't matter. Jesus said anyone. Jesus said, anyone. He he didn't say, hey, when you get that figured out, come to the cross. No, he said, bring what you have and leave it at the cross. Leave it all at the cross. Doesn't matter what it is. He said, well, you don't know the relationships I'm in. My family hates me. My kids won't talk to me. I'm in the worst chapter of my life. Doesn't matter. Anyone, anyone means anyone. Anyone would come after me. Just deny yourself and follow me. That's it. It's that easy. And by easy, I mean, we have to get past this. We have to get past this our flesh, and we cannot let our sin win the day. Anyone, anyone is anyone. And that means every single person in this room today, leave it at the cross, follow him. Let's pray together, bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, God. We thank you for this baptism Sunday. God, as we are are nearing uh, to see a handful of people, I believe we're close to 10 right now that are getting baptized here in just a few minutes. God, I'm, I'm grateful for the testimonies that we're gonna be able to share in their lives. God, I pray that, that we just continue to echo 
uh, those testimonies, that they will just live out in the people that are making the decision to follow you, but not just a decision, God, a commitment that follows that decision. It's not just, I believe you died for me, but it's, I promise to follow you for the rest of my life. God, as a church, let's not forget the second portion of that prayer. And right now, maybe you've never said that prayer. Maybe you've never made the decision to follow him. Maybe you've, you've passed step one. You say, well, I believe that but I want you to believe it and I want you to begin the process today of following Jesus. And, and, and that may mean getting out of your comfort zone. It may mean getting into an inconvenient portion of your life where you have to do things that you've never done before. That's okay. Jesus will be with you throughout it all. If you've never made that decision right now, I want you to speak to your heavenly father, just you and him. Nobody's looking around. Pray to him right now. Say, God, I know that I've sinned. I know that I've lived a life of convenience and comfort, God, and I know that the three fans in Luke chapter nine, I'm, I'm probably a way worse fan than them. But God, I know that you did something for me that I could never do for myself. You went on that cross, you died for me, but you didn't stay dead. Jesus, I know that after you died, you rose again three days later. Jesus, today, I promise to follow you for the rest of my life. I know that you died for me. I know that you rose again, but God, I want to follow you. Jesus for the rest of my life as best as I know how. If you've said that prayer for the very first time, if you've made the commitment to follow him, it's the greatest decision that you can ever make. And today, I want you to tell somebody about that. I want you to share that because we wanna walk with you. We wanna be able to help you. We wanna be able to disciple you and we do not wanna lead you astray or leave you by yourself. So please come talk to one of us. It's a baptism Sunday. What greater day than to just tell someone, hey, today I made a decision please come talk to one of us. So God, in closing, I'm very grateful for Kyle Eidelman and his book, Not a Fan. God, I pray that the congregants here, they'll just go and buy it. It's an easy listen. It's an easy read. God, that they'll read it, that they'll take the teachings of what Kyle is sharing in this book and that we can apply them in what Jesus is teaching us in Luke chapter nine. God, will we stop being a stadium of fans, but that will become a church of followers. God, we say this prayer. We love you so much. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a great week. Go build a bridge. Stick around for Baptism Sunday.